If I didn't care More than words can say If I didn't care Would I feel this way The idea really came to me the day I got my new false teeth. I was trying to shave with a bluntish razor blade. My face looked back at me out of the mirror. It's one of those bricky red faces that go with butter-coloured hair and pale blue eyes. When I've got my teeth in, I probably don't look my age, which is 45. Making a mental note to buy razor blades, I got into the bath and started soaping. I soaped my arms, I've got those kind of pudgy arms that are freckled up to the elbow, and then took the back brush and soaped my shoulder blades which in the ordinary way I can't reach. It's a nuisance, but there are several parts of my body that I can't reach nowadays. The truth is that I'm inclined to be a little bit on the fat side. I don't mean that I'm like something in a sideshow at a fair. My weight isn't much over 14 stone, and last time I measured round my waist it was either 48 or 49, I forget which, and I'm not what they call disgustingly fat. I haven't got one of those bellies that sag halfway down to the knees, it's merely that I'm a little bit broad in the beam, with a tendency to be barrel-shaped. Do you know the active, hearty kind of fat man? The athletic, bouncing type that's nicknamed Fatty or Tubby and is always the life and soul of the party? I'm that type. Fatty, they mostly call me. Fatty Bowling. George Bowling is my real name. But at that moment, I didn't feel like the life and soul of the party. Nowadays, I nearly always do have a morose kind of feeling in the early mornings. It was those bloody false teeth. Say what you will, false teeth are a landmark. When your last natural tooth goes, the time when you can kid yourself that you're a Hollywood shake is definitely at an end. This morning, there were reasons why I ought to have been in a better mood. To begin with, I was taking the day off to go and fetch my new false teeth. And besides, I had 17 quid, which nobody else had heard about. Nobody in the family, that is. It had happened this way. A chap in our firm, Mellers by name, had got hold of a book called Astrology Applied to Horse Racing, which proved that it's all a question of influence of the planets on the colours the jockey is wearing. Well, in some race or other, there was a mare called Corsair's Bride, a complete outsider, but her jockey's colour was green which it seemed was just the colour for the planets that happened to be in the ascendant. Mellers, who was deeply bitten with this astrology business, was putting several quid on the horse and went down on his knees to me to do the same. In the end, chiefly to shut him up, I risked ten bob, though I don't bet as a general rule. Sure enough, Corsair's bride came home in a walk. I forget the exact odds, but my share worked out at seventeen quid. By a kind of instinct rather queer and probably indicating another landmark in my life, I just quietly put the money in the bank and said nothing to anybody. I've never done anything of this kind before. A good husband and father would have spent it on a dress for Hilda, that's my wife, and boots for the kids. But I'd been a good husband and father for 15 years and I was beginning to get fed up with it. I lay down in the bath to think about my 17 quid and what to spend it on. The alternatives were either a weekend with a woman or dribbling it quietly away on odds and ends such as cigars and double whiskies. I was thinking about women and cigars when there was a noise like a herd of buffaloes. It was the kids, of course. Two kids in a house the size of ours is like a quart of beer in a pint mug. There was a frantic stamping outside. Dada, I want to go somewhere. Go somewhere else then. I'm having a bath. Dada! I want to go somewhere! As I opened the door, little Billy, my youngest, shot past me, dodging the smack which I aimed at his head. I went downstairs in a bad temper and ready to make myself disagreeable. Old Hilda was glooming behind the teapot in her usual state of alarm and dismay because the News Chronicle had announced that the price of butter was going up or something. She hadn't lighted the gas fire, and though the windows were shut, it was beastly cold. I bent down and put a match to the fire. She gave me the little sidelong glance that she always gives me when she thinks I'm doing something extravagant. She's one of those people who get their main kick in life out of foreseeing disasters. Only petty disasters, of course. As for wars, earthquakes, plagues, famines and revolutions, she pays no attention to them. Butter is going up and the gas bill is enormous and the kids' boots are wearing out. 
That's Hilda's litany. The kids were downstairs already. There were only the two of them, Billy aged seven and Lorna aged eleven. A great deal of the time I can hardly stick the sight of them. As for their conversation, it's just unbearable. At other times I have quite a different feeling. Sometimes I've stood over their cots on summer evenings and watched them sleeping. At such times I feel that I'm just a kind of dried-up seed pod and that my sole importance has been to bring these creatures into the world and feed them while they're growing. But that's only at moments. Most of the time I feel that there's life in the old dog yet and plenty of good times ahead. Finally, at about ten o'clock, I started out for town. Do you know the road I live in? Ellesmere Road, West Bletchley? Well, even if you don't, you know fifty others exactly like it. Long rows of little semi-detached houses, as much alike as council houses and generally uglier. The stucco front, the privet hedge, the green front door. The laurels, the myrtles, Mon Repos, Bellevue. And perhaps one house in fifty, some antisocial type who'll probably end up in the workhouse, has painted his front door blue instead of green. I had no illusions about myself that morning. It was almost as if I could stand at a distance and watch myself coming down the road. Even if you saw me at two hundred yards distance, you'd know immediately, not perhaps that I was in the insurance business, but that I was some kind of tout or salesman. I've got the look that's peculiar to people who sell things on commission, a kind of coarse, brazen look. At my best moments, I might pass for a bookie or a publican, but at ordinary times, you'd place me correctly. Economically and socially, I'm about at the average level of Ellesmere Road. What is a road like Ellesmere Road? Just a prison with the cells all in a row. A line of semi-detached torture chambers where the poor little five to ten pounder weakers quake and shiver, every one of them with the boss twisting his tail and his wife riding him like the nightmare and the kids sucking his blood like leeches. Of course, the basic trouble with people like us is that we all imagine we've got something to lose. Nine-tenths of the people in Ellesmere Road are under the impression that they own their houses. Ellesmere Road is part of a huge racket called the Hesperides Estate, the property of the Cheerful Credit Building Society. As a matter of fact, we don't own our houses, even when we finish paying for them. When Ellesmere Road was built, it gave on some open fields known as Platts Meadows, it had always been understood that Platts Meadows weren't to be built on. However, West Bletchley was a growing suburb. I've never seen Sir Herbert Crumb or any of the big noises of the cheerful credit in the flesh, but in my mind's eye, I could see their mouths watering. Suddenly the builders arrived and houses began to go up on Platts Meadows. But the really subtle swindle is the mental one. Merely because of the illusion that we own our houses and have what's called a stake in the country. We poor saps in the Hesperides are turned into Crumb's devoted slaves forever. We're all Tories, yes-men and bum-suckers. We're all bought, and what's more, we're bought with our own money. Every one of those poor, downtrodden bastards would die on the field of battle to save his country from Bolshevism. Why do they stand it? I was thinking. Pure funk, of course. Everyone that isn't scared stiff of losing his job is scared stiff of war or fascism or communism or something. There was a bombing plane flying low overhead. Two vulgar kind of blokes, obviously commercials of the lowest type, were sitting opposite me. One of them was reading the mail and the other was reading the express. I could see by their manner that they'd spotted me for one of their kind. The line from West Bletchley runs most of the way through slums, but it's kind of peaceful, the glimpses you get of little backyards and the flat roofs where the women peg out the washing. The great black bombing plane zoomed ahead. One of the commercials cocked his eye at it for just a second. I knew what he was thinking. For that matter, it's what everybody else is thinking. In two years' time, one year's time, what shall we be doing when we see one of those things? Making a dive for the cellar wetting our bags with fright. Down below you could see the roofs of the houses stretching on and on. We're just one great big bullseye. Miles and miles of streets, fried fish shops, picture houses, factories, blocks of flats, power stations. Enormous! And the peacefulness of it, like a great wilderness with no wild beasts. 
In the whole of England at this moment, there probably isn't a single bedroom window from which anyone's firing a machine gun. But how about five years from now? Or two years? Or one year? I was early for my appointment, but it was time for a bit of grub. We five to ten pound a weekers aren't well served in the way of eating places in London. Why the hell am I coming here? I thought to myself as I went in. There's a kind of atmosphere about these places that gets me down. Everything's slick and shiny and streamlined. Everything's spent on the decorations and nothing on the food. No comfort, no privacy. I ordered a large coffee and a couple of frankfurters. I can't honestly say that I'd expected the thing to have a pleasant taste. But this, a sort of horrible soft stuff was oozing all over my tongue. It was fish. A thing calling itself a frankfurter filled with fish. I got up and walked straight out without touching my coffee. I remembered I'd read in the paper somewhere about these food factories in Germany where everything's made out of something else. Airsats, they call it. It gave me the feeling that I'd bitten into the modern world and discovered what it was really made of. Everything slick and streamlined, everything made out of something else. Rotten fish in a rubber skin, bombs of filth bursting inside your mouth. When I got the new teeth in, I felt a lot better. Though very likely it sounds absurd to say that false teeth can make you feel younger, it's a fact that they did so. It struck me that really I wasn't such a bad figure of a man. There was time to have a pint. When I came out of the pub, I felt quite different, in a kind of mood in which you foresee the end of the world and get a certain kick out of it. I was walking westward up the Strand. The usual crowd that you can hardly fight your way through and the usual jam of traffic with the great red buses nosing their way between the cars and the engines roaring and horns tooting. I felt as if I was the only person awake in a city of sleepwalkers. When you walk through a crowd of strangers, it's next door to impossible not to imagine that they're all waxworks. But probably they're thinking just the same about you. But that was how I felt. We're all on the burning deck, and nobody knows it except me. Like turkeys in November, I thought. Not a notion of what's coming to them. I saw this street as it'll be in three years' time. 1941, they say it's book for. No, not all smashed to pieces. Only a little altered, kind of chipped and dirty looking, the shop windows almost empty. Down a side street there's an enormous bomb crater. It's all curiously quiet and everyone's very thin. Some days I say to myself that it's just a scare got up by the newspapers. Some days I know in my bones there's no escaping it. If I didn't care More than words can say If I didn't care Would I feel this way When I got down near Charing Cross, the boys were yelling a later edition of the evening papers. King Zog's wedding postponed. But just at that moment, a queer thing happened. King Zog's name had started memories in me. I was back in the parish church at Lower Binfield. I was Georgie Bowling, aged seven. And it was Sunday morning and I could smell the church, a peculiar, decaying, sweetish sort of smell. How it came back to me. The sweet, corpsey smell, the rustle of Sunday dresses, the wheeze of the organ. A moment later, it was as though I'd opened my eyes again and there was a traffic jam in the Strand. The petrol stink and the roar of the engines seemed to me less real than Sunday morning in Lower Binfield, 38 years ago. I tell you, it was a good world to live in. I belong to it. So do you. I suppose by this time you've got a kind of picture of me in your mind and subconsciously you've been imagining that I was just the same even when I was in my cradle. But 45 years is a long time, and I've changed a great deal. It may seem queer, but my father would probably be rather proud of me if he could see me now. He'd think it a wonderful thing that a son of his should own a motor car and live in a house with a bathroom. Even now I'm a little above my origin, and at other times I've touched levels that we should never have dreamed of in those old days before the war. 
before the war. How long shall we go on saying that, I wonder? How long before the answer will be, which war? I was born in 93, and I can actually remember the outbreak of the Boer War. Mother had fixed a wooden gate in the doorway to prevent Joe and myself, Joe was my elder brother, from getting into the shop. I can still remember standing there clutching the bars. When you're very young, you seem to suddenly become conscious of things that have been under your nose for a long time past. For instance, it was only when I was nearly four that I suddenly realised that we owned a dog. Naylor, his name was, an old white English terrier. In the same way, I discovered that beyond the gate at the end of the passage there was the shop itself, with the huge scales and the tin shovel and the white lettering on the window. I suppose Lower Binfield was just like any other market town of about 2,000 inhabitants. It was in Oxfordshire, about five miles from the Thames. It lay in a bit of a valley with hills behind. On top of the hills there were woods among which you could see a great white house with a colonnade. This was Binfield House. I must have been nearly seven before I noticed the existence of Binfield House. By that time I knew every inch of the town, which was shaped roughly like a cross with the marketplace in the middle. Our shop was in the high street, and on the corner there was Mrs Wheeler's sweet shop, where you spent a halfpenny when you had one. Mrs Wheeler was a dirty old witch, and people suspected her of sucking the bull's eyes and putting them back in the bottle. In the middle of the marketplace there was the stone horse trough, and on top of the water there was always a fine film of dust and chaff. If I shut my eyes and think of Lower Binfield any time before I was, say, eight, it's always in summer weather that I remember it. All my memories are bound up with things to eat. In September there were sloes and hazelnuts. Later on there were beech nuts and crab apples. Joe was two years older than myself. When we were very small, Mother used to pay Katie Simmons to take us out for walks in the afternoons. She was only twelve when Joe was seven and I was five, and her mental level wasn't very different from ours. But so far as conversation went, we were almost on equal terms. We used to go for long, trailing kinds of walks past the allotments and back by the upper Binfield Road so as to pass the sweet shop. Even when we had no money, we'd go that way. Katie wasn't in the least above sharing a farthing's worth of sweets and quarrelling over her share. I can see the three of us trailing along, eating stuff out of the hedge, with Katie dragging at my arm and sometimes yelling ahead to Joe. Joe, you come back here this minute. Joe was a hefty boy with a big, lumpy sort of head, the kind of boy who's always doing something dangerous. Katie used to wear a dreadful, ragged parody of a grown-up dress that descended from sister to sister in her family. She was a tiny thing, but not bad at minding children. Her family lived in a filthy little rat hole of a place in the slummy street behind the brewery. The whole family had managed to dodge going to school and started doing odd jobs as soon as they could walk. One of the elder brothers got a month for stealing turnips. Poor Katie. She had her first baby when she was 15. No one knew who was the father, and probably Katie wasn't too certain herself. Most people believe it was one of her brothers. The workhouse people took the baby, and Katie went into service. The last time I saw her was in 1913. I was biking through Walton, and I passed some dreadful wooden shacks beside the railway line. A wrinkled-up hag of a woman, looking at least fifty years old, came out of one of the huts and began shaking out a rag mat. It was Katie, who must have been twenty-seven. Thursday was market day. Chaps with round red faces and huge boots covered with dry cow dung used to drive their brutes into the marketplace early in the morning. In the evenings, the pubs were full of drunken men. All through the Boer War... The recruiting sergeant used to be in the bar of the George every Thursday and Saturday night. Sometimes next morning you'd see him leading off some great sheepish lump of a farm lad who'd taken the shilling when he was too drunk to see. People used to stand in their doorways and shake their heads when they saw them go past. They had the good old English notions that anyone who joins the army will die of drink and go straight to hell, 
But at the same time, they were good patriots and held it as an article of faith that the English had never been beaten in battle and never could be. The people's attitude towards the government was really the same. They were all true blue Englishmen and swore that foreigners were dirt, but at the same time nobody ever thought of paying a tax if there was any way of dodging it. People took politics seriously in those days. They used to begin storing up rotten eggs weeks before an election. When the Boer War broke out, I remember the big row between father and Uncle Ezekiel. Uncle Ezekiel had a little boot shop in one of the streets off the high street and also did some cobbling. He was only a half-brother and much older than father, 20 years older at least. I can hear him now having one of his arguments with father. I don't know much about my grandparents. They were dead before I was born. I only know that my grandfather had been a cobbler and late in life he married the widow of a seedsman, which is how we came to have the shop. It was a job that didn't really suit father, though he knew the business inside out and was everlastingly working. I never remember him without meal on the backs of his hands and in the lines of his face. He was a sort of grey, quiet little man, always dusty looking because of the meal. Father had been educated at Walton Grammar School, where the farmers and the better-off tradesmen sent their sons, whereas Uncle Ezekiel liked to boast that he'd never been to school in his life and had taught himself to read by a tallow candle after working hours. But he was a much quicker-witted man than father. He could argue with anybody, and he used to quote Carlyle and Spencer by the yard. Father had a slow sort of mind, and his English wasn't good. His favourite paper was The People. Mother preferred the news of the world, which she considered had more murders in it. I can see them now. Mother on one side of the fireplace starting off to read the latest murder, but gradually falling asleep with her mouth open, and father on the other, working his way slowly through the yards of smudgy print. He was a very honest man, very anxious to provide good stuff and swindle nobody, which even in those days wasn't the best way to get on in business. Mother was fat ever since I remember her. No doubt it's from her that I inherit my pituitary deficiency or whatever it is that makes you get fat. It would be an exaggeration, but not a very big one, to say that I never remember her when she wasn't cooking. I used to like to watch Mother rolling pastry. Watch a woman who really knows how to cook rolling dough. She's got a peculiar, solemn, indrawn air like a priestess celebrating a sacred rite. And in her own mind, of course, that's exactly what she is. Although she read more easily than father, she was unbelievably ignorant. I doubt whether any time up to the outbreak of the Great War she could have told you who was Prime Minister. Moreover, she hadn't the smallest wish to know such things. The old ideas about bringing up children still held good, though they were going out fast. In theory, children were still thrashed, and certainly you were liable to be sent away from table if you made too much noise eating or refused something that was good for you, or answered back. In practice, there wasn't much discipline in our family, and of the two, mother was the firmer. Father was really much too weak with us, especially with Joe. By the time Joe was twelve, he was too strong for mother to get him across her knee, and after that, there was no doing anything with him. Practically everything worth doing was forbidden, in theory anyway. According to mother, everything that a boy ever wants to do was dangerous. Swimming was dangerous, climbing trees was dangerous, and so were sliding, snowballing, hanging on behind carts, using catapults and squalers, and even fishing. All animals were dangerous, except Naylor, the two cats, and Jackie the bullfinch. Every animal had its special recognised methods of attacking you. Horses bit, bats got into your hair, earwigs got into your ears... Swans broke your leg with a blow of their wings, bulls tossed you, and snakes stung. All snakes stung, according to Mother, and when I quoted the Penny Encyclopedia to the effect that they didn't sting but bit, she only told me not to answer back. Lizards, slow worms, toads, frogs and newts also stung. All insects stung, except flies and black beetles. 
Practically all kinds of food, except the food you had at meals, were either poisonous or bad for you. Raw potatoes were deadly poison, and so were mushrooms unless you bought them at the greengrocers. Raw gooseberries gave you colic, and raw raspberries gave you a skin rash. If you had a bath after a meal, you died of cramp. If you cut yourself between the thumb and forefinger, you got lockjaw. And if you washed your hands in the water eggs were boiled in, you got warts. I think Mother thought of the world outside Lower Binfield chiefly as a place where murders were committed. The Jack the Ripper scare had happened about the time when Father and Mother were married. All along, she said, she'd had a dreadful feeling that Jack the Ripper was hiding in Lower Binfield. There were always blue bottles buzzing on summer afternoons. Ours wasn't a sanitary house. Precious few houses in Lower Binfield were. I suppose the town must have contained 500 houses and there certainly can't have been more than 50 with what we should now describe as a WC. When I think of Mother's kitchen, I always seem to hear the blue bottles buzzing and smell the dustbin. And God knows there are worse smells and sounds. Which would you sooner listen to? A blue bottle or a bombing plane? If I didn't care More than words can say If I didn't care Would I feel this way? Joe started going to Walton Grammar School two years before I did. It meant a four-mile bike ride morning and evening. For several years, we went to the dame school kept by old Mrs Howlett, though everyone knew that Mother Howlett was an old imposter and worse than useless as a teacher. Joe was only eight when he got in with a tough gang of boys who called themselves the Black Hand. The gang had a secret password and an ordeal, which included cutting your finger and eating an earthworm, and they gave themselves out to be frightful desperados. Certainly they managed to make a nuisance of themselves, broke windows, chased cows, tore the knockers off doors and stole fruit by the hundredweight. Sometimes in winter they managed to borrow a couple of ferrets and go ratting when the farmers would let them. They all had catapults and squalers and they were always saving up to buy a saloon pistol which in those days cost five shillings but the savings never amounted to more than about threepence. In summer they used to go fishing and bird nesting when Joe was at Mrs Howlett's, he used to cut school at least once a week, and even at the grammar school he managed it about once a fortnight. There was a boy at the grammar school, an auctioneer's son, who could copy any handwriting, and for a penny he'd forge a letter from your mother saying you'd been ill yesterday. Of course, I was wild to join the Black Hand, but Joe always choked me off and said they didn't want any blasted kids hanging round. Mother was always terrified of letting us go anywhere near water, but the thought of fishing sent me wild with excitement. One morning I knew that Joe was going to cut school and go out fishing, and I made up my mind to follow. In some way, Joe guessed what I was thinking about, and he started on me while we were dressing. Don't you get thinking you're coming with the gang today? We don't want any bloody kids along. Joe had learned the word bloody and was always using it. Father overheard him once and swore that he'd thrash the life out of Joe, but as usual, he didn't do so. After breakfast, Joe started off on his bike, and when it was time for me to leave for Mother Howlett's, I sneaked off and hid in the lane behind the allotments. I knew the gang were going to the pond at the mill farm, and I was going to follow them if they murdered me for it. I was eight years old, and all round me it was early summer, with great tangled hedges where the wild roses were still in bloom. And I didn't give a damn for any of it. All I was thinking of was the green pool and the gangs with their hooks and lines and bread paste. Presently, I managed to sneak up on them. Joe turned and saw me. Christ, he said, it's the kid. Now then, you, what did I tell you? You get back home double quick. I'm not going back home. Yes, you are. Presently, he began screwing my ears, which was his favourite torture. I was blubbing by this time but still I wouldn't give in. And suddenly the others swung round in my favour and told Joe to get up off my chest and let me stay if I wanted to. The farmhouse was only about 200 yards away and you had to keep out of sight because old Brewer was very down on fishing. 
The others wouldn't let me sit beside them and sent me to a rotten part of the pool, a part where no fish would ordinarily come. Still, I was fishing at last. I was sitting on the grass bank with the rod in my hands and I was happy as a tinker, although the tear marks mixed up with dirt were still all over my face. The fish weren't biting. The others kept shouting that they'd got a nibble, but it was always a lie. I suppose we must have been there about two hours when suddenly my float gave a quiver. The next moment there wasn't any doubt about it. Christ, that feeling. The line jerking and straining and a fish on the other end of it. The others saw my rod bending and the next moment they'd all rushed round to me. I gave a terrific haul and the fish came flying up through the air. The same moment all of us gave a yell of agony. The fish had slipped off the hook and fallen into the wild peppermint under the bank. Joe flung himself into the water and grabbed him in both hands. The next moment he'd flung the fish onto the grass. How we gloated! The poor dying brute flapped up and down and his scales glistened all the colours of the rainbow. It was a huge carp, seven inches long at least. But the next moment it was as though a shadow had fallen across us. We looked up, and there was old Brewer with a thick hazel stick in his hand. I'll learn he come fishing in my pool, he suddenly roared, and he was on us, whacking out in all directions. Old Brewer chased us half across the meadow. He couldn't move fast, but he got in some good swipes. I'd been at the back, and most of the wallops had landed on me. I spent the rest of the day with the gang. They hadn't made up their mind whether I was really a member yet, but for the time being they tolerated me. We went down into a chalk hollow full of beds of dead leaves and shouted to hear the echo. Someone shouted a dirty word, and then we said over all the dirty words we knew, and the others jeered at me because I only knew three. Then we went round by the lodge of Binfield House. No one ever dared go inside because old Hodges, the caretaker, was down on boys. We cheeked him over the fence until he chased us off. Then Joe found a late thrush's nest with half-fledged chicks in it. After a lot of argument, we took the chicks out, had shots at them with stones, and finally stamped on them. Finally, we trailed home. I knew that I wasn't a kid any longer. I was a boy at last. And it's a wonderful thing to be a boy to go roaming where grown-ups can't catch you and to kill birds and shout dirty words. It's a kind of strong, rank feeling, and it's all bound up with breaking rules and killing things. The smell of wild peppermint, the dirty words, the sour stink of the rubbish dump, the feel of the fish straining on the line. It was all part of it. Thank God I'm a man, because no woman ever has that feeling. Sure enough, old Brewer told everybody. Father fetched a strap and said he was going to thrash the life out of Joe. But Joe struggled and kicked and in the end father didn't get in more than a couple of whacks at him. I tried to struggle too, but I was small enough for mother to get me across her knee. Next day, the gang decided that I wasn't really a member yet. Moreover, they all made out afterwards that the fish I'd caught wasn't really a big one. But it didn't matter. I'd been fishing, and they couldn't take that away from me. For the next seven years, from when I was eight to when I was fifteen, what I chiefly remember is fishing. Don't think I did nothing else. I left Mother Howlett's and went to the grammar school, but to my surprise I did rather well. It had never occurred to me that I might be cleverer than Joe, who had bullied me ever since he could walk. Actually, Joe was an utter dunce and stayed somewhere near the bottom of the school till he was 16. My second term, I took a prize in arithmetic and another in some queer stuff that went by the name of science. I did all the things you do at school. I carved my name on a desk and I bit my nails and played conkers and passed round dirty stories and learned to masturbate and bullied the life out of little Willie Simeon, the undertaker's son, who was half-witted and believed everything you told him. Our favourite trick was to send him to shops to buy things that didn't exist. All the old gags, the hapeth of penny stamps, the rubber hammer, the left-handed screwdriver, the pot of striped paint. 
Poor Willie fell for all of them. We had Grand Sport one afternoon, putting him in a tub and telling him to lift himself up by the handles. He ended up in an asylum, poor Willie. But it was in the holidays that one really lived. There were good things to do in those days. We were cruel little beasts, and we used to catch toads, ram the nozzle of a bicycle pump up their backsides and blow them up till they burst. That's what boys are like. I don't know why. Of course, other things were happening. I grew three inches in a year, got my long trousers, took to reading, and had crazes for white mice and postage stamps. But it's always fishing that I remember. Summer days and the pools underneath like a kind of deep green glass. And it's not that I'm trying to put across any of that poetry of childhood stuff. Killing things. That's about as near to poetry as a boy gets. And yet all the while there's a power of longing for things as you can't long when you're grown up. Unlike many people, I've no wish to be young again. I don't care if I never see a cricket ball again. But I am sentimental about my childhood. Not my own particular childhood, but the civilization which I grew up in and which is now just about at its last kick. The very idea of sitting all day under a willow tree beside a quiet pool belongs to the time before the war, before the radio, before aeroplanes, before Hitler. Does anyone go fishing nowadays, I wonder? Anywhere within a hundred miles of London, there are no fish left to catch. Now all the ponds are drained, and when the streams aren't poisoned with chemicals from factories, they're full of rusty tins and motorbike tyres. When I was about 14, father did a good turn of some kind to old Hodges. The next Saturday afternoon, I biked up to Binfield House. I dug out old Hodges and got him to show me the way down to the pool. It was a good-sized pool, almost a lake. You felt as much alone as if you'd been on the banks of the Amazon, ringed completely round by the enormous beech trees. On the other side, there was a hollow with beds of wild peppermint, and up at one end an old wooden boathouse was rotting among the bulrushes. The pool was swarming with bream. There were pike there too, and yet in the two years or so that I went fishing there, how many times did I really go? Not more than a dozen. One afternoon I began to explore at the end of the pool farthest from Binfield House. You had to fight your way through a sort of jungle of blackberry bushes. I struggled through and then suddenly I came to another pool, which I had never known existed. It was a small pool, but it was very clear water and immensely deep. And then I saw something that almost made me jump out of my skin. It was an enormous fish, almost the length of my arm. I felt as if a sword had gone through me. In a moment, another huge, thick shape glided through the water, and then another, and then two more close together. They were carp, I suppose. I knew what had happened. A pool gets forgotten somehow. Nobody fishes in it for decades, and the fish grow to monstrous sizes. And not a soul in the world knew about them, except me. It was a wonderful secret for a boy to have. There was the dark pool and the monstrous fish sailing round it, fish that had never been fished for. I'd buy the tackle that would hold them if I had to steal the money out of the till. The very next Saturday afternoon I'd come back and try for them. But as it happened, I never went back. I never stole the money out of the till or had a try for those carp. I know, of course, that you think I'm exaggerating about the size of those fish. But it isn't so. I tell you, they were enormous. If I didn't care More than words can say If I didn't care Would I feel this way I don't set up to be one of those men that don't care about women. Still, if you gave me the choice of having any woman you care to name or catching a ten-pound carp, the carp would win every time. And the other confession is that after I was 16, I never fished again. 
There never seemed to be time. I was at work, I was chasing girls, I was doing correspondence courses in salesmanship and accountancy and improving my mind. Curiously enough, the only time between then and now when I did very nearly go fishing was during the war. It was in the autumn of 1916, just before I was wounded. We'd come out of trenches to a village behind the line. As usual, we didn't know for certain how long we were going to stay there. We spent the first day scraping the mud off our putties, and in the evening some of the chaps started queuing up for a couple of wretched, worn-out whores who were established in a house at the end of the village. In the morning, although it was against orders, I managed to sneak off and wander round the ghastly desolation that had once been fields. All round were the awful muck and litter of war. Trees with boughs torn off them, tin cans, turds, mud, clumps of rusty barbed wire with weeds growing through them. You know the feeling you had when you came out of the line? It was mainly boredom. Maybe next week a shell would blow you to potted meat but that wasn't so bad as the ghastly boredom of the war stretching out forever. I was wandering up the side of a hedge when I ran into a chap in our company who was nicknamed Nobby. As soon as he saw me, he beckoned to me with his head. He had a sly, vicious way of talking. Here, George. The chap still called me George. I hadn't got fat in those days. Do you see that clump of poplars across the field? Well, there's a pool on t'other side of it, and it's full of bleeding great fish. Sure enough, Nobby was right. On the other side of the poplars there was a dirty-looking pool, and it was swarming with perch. There was only one thought in both our minds, how to get hold of a rod and line. You can't know how wild we were to catch those fish. To be sitting under the poplar trees, away from the noise and the stink and the officers and the saluting and the sergeant's voice. But it wasn't at all certain that we could bring it off. If the sergeant found out, he'd stop us as sure as fate. Meanwhile, we'd no fishing tackle of any kind. The first thing was a rod. Nobby shinned up one of the poplars and cut off a small bough. He trimmed it down with his jackknife and then we hid it in the weeds near the bank and managed to sneak back without being seen. The next thing was a needle to make a hook. At last we thought of the whores at the end of the village. When we got there the house was shut up and the whores were having a sleep, which they'd no doubt earned. We banged on the door until after about ten minutes a fat ugly woman in a wrapper came down and screamed at us in French. Nobby made gestures which were supposed to represent sewing. The whore misunderstood him and opened the door a bit wider to let us in. Finally, we made her understand and got a needle from her. After dinner, the sergeant came round the barn where we were billeted. We managed to dodge him just in time. When he was gone, we got a candle alight, made the needle red hot and managed to bend it into a kind of hook. The next thing was a line. Nobody had any string except thick stuff. But at last, we came across a fellow who had a reel of sewing thread. We had to give him a whole packet of fags for it. Meanwhile, after searching all over the village, I'd managed to find a cork, and I cut it in half and stuck a match through it to make a float. By this time it was evening, and getting on towards dark. We could dig up worms anywhere. We made up our minds that as soon as roll call was over, we'd hook it and stay away all day, even if they gave us field punishment number one for it when we came back. Well, I expect you can guess the rest. At roll call, orders were to pack all kits and be ready to march in 20 minutes. We marched nine miles down the road and were off to another part of the line. Since then, I've never fished. There was the rest of the war, and then, like everyone else, I was fighting for a job, and then I'd got a job, and the job had got me. I was a promising young fellow in an insurance office. Such people don't go fishing. It wouldn't be suitable. Other recreations are provided for them. And besides fishing, there was reading. Fishing certainly came first, but reading was a good second. I must have been either ten or eleven when I started reading voluntarily. At that age, it's like discovering a new world. 
Nothing is ever like those first years when you suddenly discover that you can plunge straight into Chinese opium dens and Polynesian islands and the forests of Brazil. It was from when I was 11 to when I was about 16 that I got my biggest kick out of reading. There were practically no books in our house, and I didn't of my own accord read a good book till much later. I read the things I wanted to read, and I got more out of them than I ever got out of the stuff they taught me at school. And what makes my head go round and round While my heart stands still If I didn't care Would it be the same? So far, I've only spoken about the things that happened to me before I was 16. It was a bit before my 16th birthday that I began to get glimpses of what people call real life, meaning unpleasantness. About three days after I'd seen the big carpet Binfield house, Father came in to tea looking very worried. I was just getting up from table when he called me back. Wait a minute, George, my boy. I've been thinking it's about time you left school. Afraid you'll have to get to work now and start earning a bit to bring home to your mother. Father went on to make some rather mumbling and worried explanations. He'd had bad times lately. Things had been a bit difficult. The fact was that Father had been hit by competition. Sarazins, the big retail seedsman who had branches all over the home counties, had stuck a tentacle into Lower Binfield. Apart from wheat and oats and so forth, they branched off into such things as rat traps, bulbs, weed killer and even rabbits and day-old chicks. Father, with his dusty old shop and his refusal to stock new lines, couldn't compete with that kind of thing and didn't want to. Father had already spoken to old Grimmett, the grocer, who was willing to take me into the shop immediately. Meanwhile, Joe was to come home and help with the shop till he got a regular job. Joe had left school some time back and had been more or less loafing ever since. He was quite incapable of working steadily and spent all his time getting into fights, drinking, getting talked of with one girl after another and sticking father for money. Father was worried, puzzled and vaguely resentful. For years his profits had gone up, slowly and steadily, and now suddenly they'd gone down with a bump. He couldn't understand it. But was he really frightened by the future? I don't think so. He wasn't capable of foreseeing that these Sarazin people would systematically undersell him and eat him up. Things hadn't happened like that when he was a young man. It would be nice if I could tell you that I was a great help to my father in his time of trouble and developed qualities which no one had suspected in me. Or alternatively, I'd like to be able to record that I bitterly resented having to leave school. The truth is that I was pleased and excited at the idea of going to work, especially when I grasped that old Grimmett was going to pay me real wages. The big carp at Binfield House faded right out of it. I worked in old Grimmett's shop for nearly six years. Grimmett was a fine, upstanding, white-whiskered old chap, like a rather stouter version of Uncle Ezekiel, but he was less of a firebrand and more respected in the town. I learned to tie a parcel, grind coffee, pass off an inferior article as a good one, judge a pound of cheese by eye, and, what was a good deal the hardest, remember where the stock was kept. To this day, if you put me in front of a bacon slicer, I could work it better than I can a typewriter. I knew I wasn't going to remain a grocer's assistant forever, Sometime there'd be enough money for me to set up on my own. This was before the war, remember. There was always room for another shop. And time was slipping on. 1909, 1910, 1911. Two cinemas opened in Walton. Cars got commoner on the roads. An aeroplane, a flimsy, rickety-looking thing, flew over Lower Binfield and the whole town rushed out of their houses to yell at it. In between work and thinking about clothes and girls, I had fits of ambition and saw myself developing into a big businessman. Between 16 and 18, I cured myself of dropping H's and got rid of most of my Cockney accent. 
I did a correspondence course, learnt bookkeeping and business English, and improved my arithmetic and even my handwriting. At times I read enormously, generally crime and adventure stories. But when I was 18, I suddenly turned highbrow, got a ticket for the county library. And time was slipping away. 1910, 1911, 1912. And father's business was going down. Neither father nor mother was ever quite the same after Joe ran away from home. Joe, at 18, had grown into an ugly ruffian. He was a hefty chap with tremendous shoulders and a sulky, lowering kind of face. When he wasn't in the tap room of the George, he was loafing in the shop doorway, scowling at the people who passed, except when they happened to be girls. Late one night, he walked out of the house. He'd prized open the till and taken all the money that was in it, about eight pounds. That was enough to get him a steerage passage to America. He'd always wanted to go to America, and I think he probably did so, though we never knew for certain. We never heard of him again. The trouble over Joe aged father a great deal. Mother seemed to have shrunk a little too. A small shopkeeper going down the hill is a dreadful thing to watch. You can still keep going, always a little more worried and a little shabbier, with your capital shrinking all the time. Uncle Ezekiel died in 1911, leaving £120, which must have made a lot of difference to father. I wasn't capable of seeing, and neither was he nor anyone else, that he was being slowly ruined, and if he lived to be 70, he'd certainly end up in the workhouse. It was a race between death and bankruptcy, and, thank God, death got father first. And mother too. If I didn't care More than words can say If I didn't care Would I feel this way It was late in 1912 that I first met Elsie Waters. Elsie was tall for a girl, with pale gold, heavy kind of hair and a delicate, curiously gentle face. She worked at Lily White's, the drapers. I suppose she would have been two years older than I was. I'm grateful to Elsie because she was the first person who taught me to care about an individual woman. I hardly noticed her and then one day I went into Lily White's during working hours. As soon as you saw her, you knew that you could take her in your arms. She was very submissive, the kind that would always do what a man told her, though she wasn't either small or weak. There was a footpath under the boughs that was known as Lover's Lane. We used to go there on the May evenings when the chestnuts were in blossom, the air brushing against your face like silk, the stillness, the green water, the rushing of the weir. It'll never come again, the feeling of not being in a hurry, and not being frightened. It wasn't till late summer that we began what's called living together. I'd been too shy and clumsy to begin, and too ignorant to realise that there'd been others before me. One Sunday afternoon, we went into the beech woods round Upper Binfield. I knew quite well that she was only waiting for me to begin. Something put it into my head to go into the grounds of Binfield House. We slipped through a gap in the fence and down the footpath to the big pool. Nothing had changed. Still the utter solitude, the hidden feeling with the great trees all round you. I'd kissed her God knows how many times and wanted to take the plunge, only I was half frightened. And curiously enough, there was another thought in my mind. Now I was so near, it seemed a pity not to go down to the other pool and have a look at the big carp. I actually started wandering along the bank in that direction, and then I turned back. I wanted Elsie very badly. She was lying on the grass with her arm over her face, and she looked kind of yielding, as though her body was a kind of malleable stuff that you could do what you liked with. Suddenly I stopped being frightened. I knelt down and took hold of her. I can smell the wild peppermint yet. It was my first time, but it wasn't hers. 
and we didn't make such a mess of it as you might expect. So that was that. The big carp faded out of my mind again, and in fact, for years afterwards, I hardly thought about them. The spring of 1914. First the blackthorn, then the hawthorn, then the chestnuts in blossom. The path under the chestnut trees and Elsie's body against me. It's quite true that if you look back on any special period of time, you tend to remember the pleasant bits. But it's also true that people then had something that we haven't got now. It was simply that they didn't think of the future as something to be terrified of. It isn't that life was softer then than now. Actually, it was harsher. People on the whole worked harder, lived less comfortably and died more painfully. The houses had no bathrooms, the back streets stank like the devil in hot weather. And yet, what was it that people had in those days? A feeling of security, even when they weren't secure. More exactly, it was a feeling of continuity. Whatever might happen to themselves, things would go on as they'd known them. It's easy enough to die if the things you care about are going to survive. Father was failing, and he didn't know it. To the end, he believed that with thrift, hard work and fair dealing, a man can't go wrong. And mother never lived to know that the life of a decent, God-fearing shopkeeper's wife was finished forever, that everything they'd believed in was just so much junk. Then came the end of July, and even Lower Binfield grasped that things were happening. For several days there was a strange stifled feeling, a kind of waiting hush, like the moment before a thunderstorm breaks. And then one afternoon a boy came rushing down the high street with an armful of papers. Everyone was shouting, We've come in! We've come in! We rushed out onto the pavement, all three assistants, and cheered. Everybody was cheering. Yes, cheering. Two months later, I was in the army. Seven months later, I was in France. I wasn't wounded till late in 1916. I think it was the third shell that got me. I felt as if an enormous hand made of air was sweeping me along. It was only a lot of small shell splinters that had lodged in one side of my bottom and down the backs of my legs. But luckily I'd broken a rib in falling, which made it just bad enough to get me back to England. The CO had sent my name in for a commission a little before I was wounded. I went straight from the hospital to an officer's training camp near Colchester. It was less than three years since I'd been a spry young shop assistant with a grocer's life ahead of me. Father died in 1915. I was in France at the time. I don't exaggerate when I say that father's death hurts me more now than it did then. At the time, it was just a bit of bad news, which I accepted almost without interest, in the sort of empty-headed, apathetic way in which one accepted everything in the trenches. In the old days, with father dead and mother with £200 in the world, you'd have seen stretching out in front of you a kind of 15-act tragedy. But now, the war and the feeling of not being one's own master overshadowed everything. She came across to see me in the hospital at Eastbourne. It was over two years since I'd seen her, and she seemed to have faded and somehow to have shrunken. I'd known her as a great, splendid, protecting kind of creature. And after all, she was only a little old woman in a black dress. That was the last time I saw her alive. Well, we buried her next to father, and that was my last glimpse of Lower Binfield. Nearly all the men I'd known as boys were gone, and some of them were dead. I saw all the changes, and yet it was as though I didn't see them. My mind was on other things, chiefly the pleasure of being seen in my second Lutz uniform, with my new whipcord breeches. I distinctly remember that I was still thinking about those whipcord breeches when we stood at the graveside. Don't think I didn't feel for Mother's death. I did. 
but the thing I didn't care a damn about was the passing away of the old life I'd known. We drove past the shop. It was shut up and the window pane was black with dust. Father, mother, Joe, old Naylor the terrier, all gone. And I didn't care a damn. Also, I was thanking God that I hadn't happened to run into Elsie. The war did extraordinary things to people. It was like a great flood rushing you along to death and suddenly it would shoot you up some backwater where you'd find yourself doing incredible and pointless things. This was what happened to myself, or very likely, I wouldn't be here. As soon as the OC of the training camp heard that I knew something about the grocery trade, I didn't let on that I'd actually been behind the counter, he told me to send my name in to act as some kind of secretary to Sir Joseph Cheam, who was a big noise in the ASC. Three days later, I was saluting in Sir Joseph's office. He was a lean, upright, rather handsome old boy. In private life, he was chairman of one of the big chain groceries. He stopped writing as I came in and looked me over. You a gentleman? No, sir. Good. Then perhaps we'll get some work done. In about three minutes, he'd wormed out of me that I had no secretarial experience, couldn't use a typewriter, and had worked in a grocery at 28 shillings a week. However, he said that I'd do. There were too many gentlemen in this damned army, and he'd been looking for somebody who could count beyond ten. Just at this moment, the mysterious powers that seemed to be running the war drove us apart again. There was some vague idea of establishing dumps of rations and other stores at various points along the coast. Sir Joseph was supposed to be responsible for the dumps in the southwest corner of England. The day after I joined his office, he sent me down to check over the stores at a place called Twelve Mile Dump on the North Cornish coast. I'd just got there and discovered that the stores consisted of a mere 11 tins of bully beef when a wire arrived from the war office telling me to take charge of the stores at 12 Mile Dump. I wired back, no stores at 12 Mile Dump. Too late. I remained guarding those 11 tins of bully beef from halfway through 1917 to the beginning of 1919. Once a month, they sent me an enormous official form. I just entered nil against everything and sent the form back. Meanwhile, I was doing something I'd never before had the chance to do as a full-time job. Reading. The only books I'd ever voluntarily read were detective stories and once in a way a smutty sex book. But there I was, in a job where there was less than nothing to do, and a whole row of books staring at me in the face. These books I'm speaking of weren't in the least highbrow. But now and again it so happens that you strike a book which is exactly at the mental level you've reached at the moment, so much so that it seems to have been written especially for you. One of them was H.G. Wells's The History of Mr. Polly. Books like that started you thinking. Well, for several months I had an appetite for books that was almost like physical thirst. Wells, Conrad, Kipling, Galsworthy, O. Henry... I just revelled in them. I got a lot of kick out of Oscar Wilde's Dorian Gray. I even had a go at Ibsen, who left me with a vague impression that in Norway it's always raining. Even at the time it struck me as queer. At any rate, that year of reading novels was the only real education that I've ever had. It did certain things to my mind. It gave me a kind of questioning attitude, which I probably wouldn't have had if I'd gone through life in a normal, sensible way. But the thing that really changed me wasn't so much the books I read as the rotten meaninglessness of the life I was leading in 1918. Here I was, and a few hundred miles away in France, droves of wretched children were being driven into the machine-gun barrage. The official forms came in once a month and I sent them back, and so it went on. The effect of all this was to leave me with a feeling of disbelief in everything. It would be an exaggeration to say that the war turned people into highbrows, but it did turn them into nihilists for the time being. If the war didn't happen to kill you, it was bound to start you thinking.
You couldn't go on regarding society as something eternal and unquestionable. You knew it was just a bull's up. If I didn't care More than words can say If I didn't care Would I feel this way It was a queer time those years after the Great War, almost queerer than the war itself. I was discovering what three quarters of the blokes who'd been officers were discovering. Every mortal job was filled already. And still it never occurred to me to go back to the grocery business. I could hardly have imagined going back to the old safe existence behind the counter. I wanted to be a travelling salesman, which I knew would suit me. But there were no jobs with a salary attached. What there were, however, were on-commission jobs. I'm the type that can sell things on commission, but I never came anywhere near making a decent living. I had about a year of it altogether. The cross-country journeys, the ghastly bed-and-breakfast houses where the sheets always smell faintly of slops. I don't know whether I learned much in that year, but it drove into the back of my head the notions that I'd picked up reading novels. I was down among the realities of modern life. And what are the realities of modern life? Well, the chief one is that feeling that you've got to be everlastingly fighting and hustling, that there's always somebody after your job, the next month they'll be reducing staff and it's you that'll get the bird. That, I swear, didn't exist in the old life before the war. But meanwhile, I knew that sooner or later I'd get a regular job. I'm not the type that starves. It happened when I was peddling paper clips and typewriter ribbons. I just dodged into a huge block of offices in Fleet Street when I saw that some very big bug was coming down the corridor in the other direction. When he got nearly up to me, I saw that it was Sir Joseph Cheam. To my surprise, he stopped and spoke to me. Hello, you. I've seen you somewhere before. What's your name? Bowling, sir. Used to be in the ASC. Of course. The boy that said he wasn't a gentleman. What are you doing here? I had one of those sudden inspirations that you get occasionally. I said, well, sir, as a matter of fact, I'm looking for a job. A job, eh? Hmm. Not so easy nowadays. I saw his rather good-looking old face looking me over and realised that he'd decided to help me. He'd been marching past me in his power and glory with his underlings after him, and then on some whim or other he turned aside like an emperor suddenly chucking a coin to a beggar. So, you want a job? What can you do? Again the inspiration. Stick to the truth. I said, Nothing, sir, but I want a job as a travelling salesman. Salesman? Hmm, let's see. He pursed his lips up. Finally, he said, How do you like to go into an insurance firm? Always fairly safe, you know. Of course, I jumped at the idea. Sir Joseph scribbled me a note to some higher up in the flying salamander. Then I thanked him and he marched on. And we never saw one another again. Well, I got the job. And as I said earlier, the job got me. I've been with the flying salamander close on 18 years. A couple of days a week I'm working in the district office and the rest of the time I'm travelling around. When I look back, I realise that my active life ended when I was 16. Things were still happening, the war for instance, up to the time when I got the job with the flying salamander. After that, there was nothing in my life that you could properly describe as an event, except at the beginning of 23, I got married. I was living in a boarding house in Ealing. I was fairly well thought of in the firm and pretty satisfied with life. I'd learned to play tennis, didn't dance too badly, and got on with the girls. At nearly 30, I wasn't a bad-looking chap. It was at the tennis club that I first met Hilda. At that time, Hilda was 24. She was a small, slim, rather timid girl. If she said anything at all, it was usually, Oh yes, I think so too, agreeing with whoever had spoken last. If you're married... There'll have been times when you've said to yourself, why the hell did I do it? And God knows I've said it often enough about Hilda. Partly, of course, because she was young and in a way very pretty. 
Beyond that, I can only say that Hilda belonged to a class I only knew by hearsay, the poverty-stricken officer class, soldiers, clergymen, Anglo-Indian officials and that kind of thing. I don't mean that I married Hilda because she belonged to the class I'd once served across the counter. It was merely that I couldn't understand her and therefore was capable of being goofy about her. And one thing I certainly didn't grasp was that the girls in these penniless middle-class families will marry anything in trousers just to get away from home. Old Vincent, Hilda's father, had been not only in India, but also in some even more outlandish place, Borneo or Sarawak. Since then, he and his wife had shown about as much activity, mental or physical, as a couple of shellfish. But at the time, I was inclined to kowtow to these decayed throwouts as my social and intellectual superiors, while they, on the other hand, mistook me for a rising young businessman. Right from the start, it was a flop. After a year or two, I stopped wanting to kill her and started wondering about her. Here was this pretty, delicate girl, and within only about three years, she'd settled down into a depressed lifeless, middle-aged frump. I'm not denying that I was part of the reason, but whoever she'd married, it would have been much the same. Hilda's often told me that almost the first thing she can remember is a ghastly feeling that there was never enough money for anything. I've got more the proles attitude towards money. Life's here to be lived, and if we're going to be in the soup next week, well, next week is a long way off. What really shocks her is the fact that I refuse to worry. On the other hand, Hilda isn't in the least a snob. She's never looked down on me because I'm not a gentleman. On the contrary, from her point of view, I'm much too lordly in my habits. We never have a meal in a tea shop without a frightful row in whispers because I'm tipping the waitress too much. After I was made an inspector, I was more away from home and had more opportunities with other women. Of course I was unfaithful. I won't say all the time, but as often as I got the chance. Curiously enough, Hilda was jealous. Considering how little that kind of thing means to her, I wouldn't have expected her to mind. I'm more or less permanently under suspicion, though God knows in the last few years I've been innocent enough. You have to be, when you're as fat as I am. There have been times when I've thought of separation or divorce but in our walk of life, you don't do those things. You can't afford to. And then time goes on, and you kind of give up struggling. Besides, there were the kids. Kids are a link, as they say. Not to say a ball and fetter. And now it's 38, and in every shipyard in the world, they're riveting up the battleships for another war. When I came home that evening... I was still in doubt as to what I'd spent my 17 quid gambling winnings on. Hilda said she was going to the left book club meeting. In a general way, I'm not much of a one for lectures, but the visions of war I'd had that morning had put me in a kind of thoughtful mood. The lecturer was rather a mean-looking little chap, but a good speaker. Of course, he was pitching into Hitler and the Nazis. I wasn't particularly keen to hear what he was saying, but now and again a phrase that struck out and caught my attention. Sadism. Concentration camps. Back to the Dark Ages. European civilization. Defense of democracy. Democracy. Fascism. Democracy. Fascism. Immediately in front of me, the local Communist Party branch was sitting. All three of them very young. One of them's got money and is something in the Hesperides estate company. In fact, I believe he's old Crumb's nephew. Another's a clerk at one of the banks, a nice boy with a round, eager face. Next to these three, another communist was sitting, a different kind of communist, and not quite, because he's what they call a Trotskyist. He's even younger, a very thin, very dark, nervous-looking boy. These four were taking the lecture quite differently from the others. I shut my eyes for a moment. The same thing, over and over again. Hate, hate, hate. Let's all get together and have a good hate. But with my eyes shut, I saw the vision that he was seeing. What he's saying is merely that Hitler's after us, 
but what he's seeing is something quite different. It's a picture of himself smashing people's faces in with a spanner. Fascist faces, of course. Smash! The bones cave in like an eggshell. And it's all OK, because the smashed faces belong to fascists. Likeliest explanation, because he's scared. Every thinking person nowadays is stiff with fright. This is merely a chap who's got sufficient foresight to be a little more frightened than the others. War. It's coming soon, that's certain. But it isn't the war that matters, it's the after-war. The world we're going down into, the kind of hate world, slogan world. And the processions and the crowds of a million people all cheering for the leader. Some days I know it's impossible, other days I know it's inevitable. And what'll happen to chaps like me when we get fascism in England? The truth is it probably won't make the slightest difference. As for the lecturer and those four communists in the audience, they'll be smashing faces or having their own smashed. But the ordinary middling chaps like me will be carrying on just as usual. There was the usual hollow little sound of clapping that you get when there are only about 15 people in the audience. The four communists had a good dogfight that went on for about 10 minutes. As I edged my way along the row of chairs to get out, the fair-haired one appealed to me. Mr Bowling, if war broke out and we had the chance to smash fascism once and for all, wouldn't you fight? If you were young, I mean. You bet I wouldn't, I said. I had enough to go on with the last time. But this time it's different. When you hear about what's going on in Germany and the concentration camps and the Nazis making the Jews spit in each other's faces, doesn't it make your blood boil? I went off the boil in 1916. And so will you, when you know what a trench smells like. And then, all of a sudden, I knew just what he felt. Here he is, a bank clerk in a godless suburb, bum-sucking to the manager... And over in Europe, the big stuff's happening. Of course he's spoiling for a war. And I thought of that sweltering hot day in August when we all rushed out onto the pavement in our white aprons and cheered. Listen, son, I said, you've got it all wrong. In 1914, we thought it was going to be a glorious business. Well, it wasn't. If it comes again, you keep out of it. If I didn't care More than words can say If I didn't care Would I feel this way? I wanted somebody to talk to, the way you can't talk in a pub. I wanted to talk about the bad time that's either coming or isn't coming the slogans and the streamlined men who were going to knock old England cockeyed. Suddenly it occurred to me to go and look up old Portius. Lives all alone with his books and his pipe. He's a learned kind of chap with his Greek and Latin and poetry and all that. As I tapped on the front door, he came strolling out. He's rather striking looking, very tall, with curly grey hair and a thin, dreamy face that might almost belong to a boy although he must be nearly 60. You can't look at him without seeing the way he's lived written all over him. Public school, Oxford, and then back to his old school as a master. I suppose from his point of view I'm a bit of a bounder. He tells me sometimes that it's a pity I'm insensible to beauty, which I suppose is a polite way of saying that I've got no education. All the same, I like him. He's always ready to have you in and talk at all hours, and always got drinks handy. He shoved me into the old leather armchair by the fire and dished out whiskey and soda. That intolerable woman upstairs has purchased a wireless set, he said. I had been hoping to live the rest of my life out of the sound of those things. Do you happen to know the legal position? It tickles me in 1938 to find someone objecting to having a radio in the house. Almost instantly, he'd begun talking about some law against musical instruments that was passed in Athens in the time of Pericles. He never reads a modern book and takes a pride in telling you that he's never been to the pictures. 
Except for a few poets like Keats and Wordsworth, he thinks the modern world, the last 2,000 years, just oughtn't to have happened. I'm part of the modern world myself, but I like to hear him talk. It's funny that he ever cottoned on to a chap like me, but it's one of the advantages of being fat that you can fit into almost any society. Besides, we meet on common ground when it comes to dirty stories. They're the one modern thing he cares about, though, as he's always reminding me, they aren't modern. Old Porteous has got photographs of wall paintings somewhere in Italy that would make your hair curl. When I'm fed up with business and home life, it's often done me a lot of good to go and have a talk with Porteous. But tonight, it didn't seem to. Finally, I said, Tell me, Porteous, what do you think of Hitler? Hitler? This German person? My dear fellow, I don't think of him. But the trouble is he's going to bloody well make us think about him before he's finished. I see no reason for paying any attention to him. Ephemeral, purely ephemeral. I'm not certain what the word ephemeral means, but I stick to my point. I think you've got it wrong. Old Hitler's something different. So's Joe Stalin. They're after something quite new. My dear fellow, there is nothing new under the sun. Finally, he hauls a book out of the shelves and reads me a passage about some Greek tyrant back in the B.C.s who certainly might have been Hitler's twin brother. God knows at normal times I don't have many interests that you wouldn't expect a middle-aged seven-pound a weeker with two kids to have. And yet I've enough sense to see that the old life we're used to is being sawn off at the roots. There are millions of others like me. Ordinary chaps that I meet everywhere can feel things cracking and collapsing under their feet. And yet here's this learned chap who soaked himself in history and he doesn't think Hitler matters. A curious thought struck me. He's a ghost. Nearly all the people who don't want to go round smashing faces in with spanners are like that. They think that England will never change and that England's the whole world. Can't grasp that it's just a leftover, a tiny corner that the bombs happen to have missed. But what about the new kind of men, the streamlined men who think in slogans and talk in bullets? They're on our track. Dead men and live gorillas. Doesn't seem to be anything between. I cleared out about half an hour later, having completely failed to convince old Porteous that Hitler matters. I was still thinking the same thoughts as I walked home through the shivery streets. The house was all dark and Hilda was asleep. I dropped my false teeth into the glass of water in the bathroom, got into my pyjamas, and prized Hilda over to the other side of the bed. At that moment, the destiny of Europe seemed to me more important than the rent and the kids' school bills. For anyone who has to earn his living, such thoughts are just plain foolishness. The last thing I remember wondering before I fell asleep was why the hell a chap like me should care. And what makes my head go round and round While my heart stands still If I didn't care Would it be the same? I was making for Pudley. By God, what a day! the kind of day that generally comes sometime in March when winter suddenly seems to give up fighting. I got to a spot where the grass beside the road was smothered in primroses. I felt I'd got to get out and perhaps even pick a few primroses if there was nobody coming. A lark singing somewhere. Otherwise, not a sound. I was alone, quite alone. I felt happy. I felt that though I shan't live forever... I'd be quite ready to. I bent down to pick a primrose. Couldn't reach it. Too much belly. I squatted down on my haunches and picked a little bunch of them. Lucky there was no one to see me. I knew what I looked like already, but the thing that struck me was that it doesn't matter. I don't even want to be young again. I only want to be alive. Why don't people just walk round looking at things? That pool, for instance, all the stuff that's in it, newts, water snails, leeches, and God knows how many other things. 
and all the while the sort of feeling of wonder, the peculiar flame inside you. It's the only thing worth having, and we don't want it. I know perfectly well that if you hadn't a full belly and a warm house, you wouldn't want to pick flowers, but that's not the point. Stop chasing whatever you're chasing. Calm down, let a bit of peace seep into your bones. No use, we don't do it. And the next war coming over the horizon. As I've said several times already, I'm not frightened of the war, only the after war. The barbed wire, the slogans, the corked line cellars where the executioner plugs you from behind. It means goodbye to this special feeling inside you. It's gone forever if the rubber truncheon boys get hold of us. I picked up my bunch of primroses, and just at this moment there was the zoom of a car coming up the road. I suddenly realised I was wandering round picking primroses when I ought to have been going through the inventory at that ironmonger's shop in Pudley. What was more, it suddenly struck me what I'd look like if those people in the car saw me. A fat man in a bowler hat holding a bunch of primroses. I just had time to chuck them over the hedge. It was a good job I'd done so. The car was full of young fools of about twenty. Even now they might somehow guess what I'd been doing. Better let them think it was something else. As the car went past, I pretended to be doing up a fly button. Curiously enough, in the very moment when I was doing up the fly button, a wonderful idea had occurred to me. I'd go back to Lower Binfield. Don't imagine that I had any ideas of going back to live in Lower Binfield. But what was to stop me having a week there all by myself, on the QT, a week of loafing around and listening to the quietness? Of course, I knew that even in Lower Binfield life would have changed, but the place itself wouldn't have. It was a bit like one of those eastern sages retiring into a desert. But it wasn't that I wanted to watch my navel, I only wanted to get my nerve back before the bad times begin. The very thought of going back to Lower Binfield had done me good already. You know the feeling I had. Coming up for air. Like the big sea turtles when they come paddling up to the surface and fill their lungs with a great gulp before they sink down again. We're all stifling at the bottom of a dustbin, but I'd found the way to the top. There wasn't much doubt Hilda would find out. Best thing would be to tell her that I was being sent on some special job to Nottingham or Derby or some other place a good long way away. But of course she'd find out sooner or later. She'd start off by pretending to believe it. She lies low till she's found out all the weak points in your alibi and then suddenly comes out with the whole dossier of the case. The one completely hopeless thing would be to tell her just where I'd spent that week and why. She'd never believe that. I'd had another idea, almost bigger than the first. I'd go and catch those big carp in the pool at Binfield House. I thought of it, waiting for me all those years, and the huge black fish still gliding round it. I hadn't had any difficulty in fixing things with the firm. As for Hilda, I'd fitted her up with a story that was watertight. I'd fixed on Birmingham for my alibi, and I'd even told her the name of the hotel I was going to stay at, Rowbottom's Family and Commercial. After thinking it over, I took young Saunders partly into my confidence. He'd happened to mention that he'd be passing through Birmingham on the 18th of June, and I got him to promise that he'd post a letter from me to Hilda, addressed from Rowbottom's, to tell her that I might be called away. I drove along at a gentle 15. I was still inside the boundary of my own district, as the firm calls it. The fact was, I was feeling guilty about the whole business. It's not too late, I thought. There's still time to do the respectable thing. But no, I swung the car westward. I was no sooner on the Oxford Road than I actually had a feeling that they were after me already. All the people who couldn't understand why a middle-aged man should sneak away for a quiet week in the place where he spent his boyhood. It was as if a huge army was streaming up the road behind me. Hilda was in front, of course, with the kids tagging after her, and Sir Herbert Crumb and the higher-ups of the Flying Salamander in their Rolls Royces, and all the chaps at the office, 
and all the poor downtrodden pen pushers from Ellesmere Road, and the people whom you've never seen but who rule your destiny all the same, the Home Secretary, Scotland Yard, the Bank of England, Hitler and Stalin on a tandem bicycle, the Pope. They were all of them after me. I could almost hear them shouting, There's a chap who thinks he's going to escape. Stop him! I actually took a peep through the little window at the back of the car to make sure I wasn't being followed. But there was nobody. Only the dusty white road and the long line of the elms dwindling out behind me. If I didn't care More than words can say If I didn't care would I feel this way? I came towards Lower Binfield over Chamford Hill, the way we used to go when we biked home from fishing in the Thames. When you get just past the crown of the hill, you can see Lower Binfield lying in the valley below you. As I drove up Chamford Hill, I realised that the picture I'd had of it in my mind was almost entirely imaginary. The road was tarmac, whereas in the old days it used to be macadam. In the old days there used to be huge beeches growing in the hedgerows, and in places their boughs met and made a kind of arch. Now they were all gone. I'd nearly got to the top of the hill when I came on something which was certainly new. To the right of the road there was a whole lot of fake picturesque houses with overhanging eaves and whatnot. I thought for a moment. Yes, I remembered. Where those houses stood there used to be a little oak plantation, and in spring the ground underneath them used to be smothered in anemones. Another minute and Lower Binfield would be in sight. At the very thought of seeing it again, an extraordinary feeling that started in my guts crept upwards and did something to my heart. I declutched and... Jesus! You can say I was a bloody fool not to expect it, and so I was. The first question was, where was Lower Binfield? I don't mean that it had been demolished. It had merely been swallowed. I was looking down at a good-sized manufacturing town. I remember what Lower Binfield used to look like from the top of Chamford Hill. Except for a few outlying houses, the town was roughly the shape of a cross. The chief landmarks were the church tower and the chimney of the brewery. At this moment... I couldn't distinguish either of them. All I could see was an enormous river of brand new houses. Where was the town I used to know? It was buried somewhere in the middle of that sea of bricks. Towards the eastern end of the town there were two enormous factories of glass and concrete. I started slowly down the hill. The houses had climbed halfway up it. You know, those very cheap, small houses which run up a hillside in one continuous row, with the roofs rising one above the other like a flight of steps. But before I got to the houses, I stopped again. On the left of the road, there was something else that was quite new. The cemetery. It was enormous. Twenty acres, I should think. It wasn't only that the town had grown so vast that they needed twenty acres to dump their corpses in. It was there putting the cemetery out here, on the edge of the town. All the way down the hill I was seeing ghosts, chiefly the ghosts of hedges and trees and cows. But there weren't any fields or any bulls. It was houses, houses everywhere. And blokes walking up and down, and women shaking out mats, and snotty-nosed kids playing along the pavement. All strangers. They'd all come crowding in while my back was turned. I braced up and faced it. Towns have got to grow, people have got to live somewhere. Besides, the old town hadn't been annihilated. In a few minutes I'd be seeing it again, the church and the brewery chimney and father's shop window. I got to the bottom of the hill. Houses, shops, cinemas, chapels, football grounds. New, all new. Again I had that feeling of a kind of enemy invasion having happened behind my back. There was a big square, though you couldn't properly call it a square because it was no particular shape. And the newness of everything. The raw, mean look. But suddenly I swung into a street with older houses. 
Gosh, the high street. I knew every inch of it now. The old shop was down the other end of the high street, and every inch a memory. I knew all the shops, though all the names had changed, and the stuff they dealt in had mostly changed as well. Now for their horse trough in the marketplace. The horse trough was gone. I turned the corner and ran down to the George. The George had altered too, all except the name. The front had been doled up and the sign was different. The cobbled yard where the farmer's traps used to stand and the drunks used to puke on Saturday nights had been concreted over with garages all round it. I backed the car into one of the garages and got out. During the last quarter of an hour, I'd had what you could fairly describe as a shock. I'd felt it when I stopped at the top of Chamford Hill and suddenly realised that Lower Binfield had vanished and there'd been another little stab when I saw the horse trough was gone. But as I stepped out of the car, I suddenly felt that it didn't matter a damn. It was such a lovely sunny day. I strolled into the hotel with a consequential kind of air. I felt pretty prosperous, and probably I looked it. I believe that day I could have passed for a stockbroker. The George had got so smart I wouldn't have known it. In the old days it had been only a pub, though it had a room or two to let. A smart-looking young woman, who I suppose was a clerk or something, took my name at the office. You wish for a room, sir? Certainly, sir. What name shall I put down, sir? I paused. After all, this was my big moment. She'd be pretty sure to know the name. We were one of the old Lower Binfield families, the Bowlings of Lower Binfield. Bowling, I said very distinctly. Mr. George Bowling. Bowling, sir. B O A O. B O W. Yes, sir. And are you coming from London, sir? No response. She'd never heard of me. Never heard of George Bowling, son of Samuel Bowling. Samuel Bowling, who had had his half pint in this same pub every Saturday for over thirty years. The lunch wasn't bad. There was one other person lunching there, a woman of about thirty with fair hair, looked like a widow. I wondered whether she was staying at the George and made vague plans to get off with her. It's funny how your feelings get mixed up. The past was sticking out into the present, the great solid farmers throwing their legs under the long table with their hobnails grating on the stone floor. And then the little tables with their wine glasses and folded napkins and the faked-up decorations would blot it out again. And I'd think, I'm little Georgie Bowling, and who'd have believed I'd ever come back to Lower Binfield in my own motor car? It wasn't till nearly tea time that I went out. I strolled up to the marketplace and turned to the left. The shop. Twenty-one years ago, the day of Mother's funeral, I'd seen it all shut up and dusty, and I hadn't cared a damn. And now, when I was so much further away from it, the thought of seeing it again did things to my heart and guts. An arty-looking sign, painted by the same chap as did the one at the George, I shouldn't wonder, hanging out over the pavement. Wendy's Tea Shop. Morning coffee. Homemade cakes. A tea shop. They'd evidently turned both the shop and what used to be the parlour into tea rooms. I went through into the parlour. More ghosts. The two lumpy old red armchairs where father and mother used to sit on opposite sides of the fireplace, reading the people and the news of the world on Sunday afternoons. There was a young woman in a kind of print wrapper who met me with a sour expression. I asked her for tea, and she was ten minutes getting it. I had a kind of longing to tell her that I belonged to this house, or rather, what I really felt, that the house belonged to me. What was the good of telling her I'd been born in the house? It wouldn't interest her. She'd never heard of Samuel Bowling, corn and seed merchant. One thing that I'd been half afraid of, and half looking forward to, was being recognised by people I used to know. But I needn't have worried. There wasn't a face I knew anywhere in the streets. It seemed as if the whole town had got a new population. When I got to the church, I saw why they'd had to have a new cemetery. 
The churchyard was full to the brim, and half the graves had names on them that I didn't know. But the names I did know were easy enough to find. True, who used to keep the George, and Mrs Wheeler from the sweet shop, they were all lying there. An old Grimmett under a huge marble thing, shaped rather like a veal and ham pie. And Brewer of the Mill Farm with his wicked old face like something carved out of a nut. Nothing left of any of them, except a slab of stone and God knows what underneath. I found Mother's grave and Father's beside it. Uncle Ezekiel's was a little way away. What do you feel when you see your parents' graves after twenty years? I don't know what you ought to feel, but I'll tell you what I did feel, and that was nothing. Father and mother have never faded out of my mind. I went back to the George. Presently the fair-haired dame, the one I thought might be a widow, came in. I had a sudden desperate yearning to get off with her, wanted to show myself that there's life in the old dog yet. In my blue suit I didn't look so bad. A bit fat, no doubt, but distingué. I put on my toniest accent and said casually, Wonderful June weather we're having. It was a pretty harmless remark, wasn't it? Nor in the same class as haven't I met you somewhere before. But it wasn't a success. She didn't answer, merely lowered for about half a second the paper she was reading and gave me a look that would have cracked a window. In that split second, I saw how hopelessly I'd got her wrong. She wasn't the kind of widow with dyed hair who likes being taken out to dance halls. She was upper middle class and been to one of those good schools where they play hockey. And I got myself wrong too. New suit or no new suit, I couldn't pass for a stockbroker. Merely looked like a commercial traveller who'd happened to get hold of a bit of dough. I sneaked off to the private bar to have a pint or two before dinner. The barmaid was a friendly sort, thirty-five-ish, with a mild kind of face. I used to live in Lower Binfield myself, I told her. A good while back it was, before the war. The town's grown. It's the factories, I suppose. And then she told me about the big military aerodrome near Walton. That accounted for the bombing planes I kept seeing. And the next moment we'd started talking about the war, as usual. Funny. It was exactly to escape the thought of war that I'd come here. But how can you, anyway? It's in the air you breathe. As the barmaid came back to my side of the bar, I said, By the way, who's got the hall nowadays? It's Dr Merrill's got Binfield House now. He's got more than 60 patients up there, they say. Patients? Have they turned it into a hospital or something? Well, it's not what you'd call an ordinary hospital. More of a sanatorium. It's mental patients, really. What they call a mental home. A loony bin. But after all, what else could you expect? If I didn't care More than words can say if I didn't care, would I feel this way? I crawled out of bed with a bad taste in my mouth and my bones creaking. The fact was that I'd had a bit too much to drink the day before. I went to the window, a lovely June day again. Although it was only about half past eight, there was quite a crowd of people coming and going. Bloody interlopers. 20,000 gate crashers who didn't even know my name. And here was I, watching them from a window. Christ, I thought, I was wrong to think that I was seeing ghosts. I'm the ghost myself. But after breakfast, I felt better. By God, I thought, if I'm a ghost, I'll haunt the old places. Two days I spent just wandering round the old landmarks, and all that time I never ran across a soul that knew me. If I wasn't actually invisible, I felt like it. The mill farm had vanished, the cow pond where I caught my first fish had been drained and filled up and built over. In the centre of the old town, on the other hand, things hadn't changed much. A lot of the shops were still doing the same line of trade, although the names were different. Mother Wheeler's little window had been bricked over. 
The only shop that was still in the same hands was Sarazin's, the people who'd ruined father. They'd swollen to enormous dimensions, and they'd turned into a kind of general store. Sometimes it seemed to me that it didn't matter a damn if Lower Binfield had been obliterated. There was no reason why I shouldn't do all the things I wanted to do. On the Saturday afternoon, I even went to the fishing tackle shop in the high street, and the shopman didn't see anything funny in a fat middle-aged man buying a fishing rod. I even bought the strongest salmon trace he'd got, with an eye to those big carp at Binfield House, in case they still existed. I drove over Chamford Hill. Down at the bottom, I got out of the car and walked. As I got nearer the river, I came into the sound of gramophones, and the river was crammed with boats, rowing boats, canoes, punts, motor launches, full of young fools, all of them screaming and shouting. A crowd like that would be enough to scare every fish in creation, but actually I doubted whether there were any fish to catch. I remember the Thames water as it used to be, a kind of luminous green that you could see deep into. You couldn't see three inches into the water now. It's all brown and dirty with a film of oil in it from the motorboats, not to mention the fag ends and the paper bags. I knew I'd never come back. Wherever I go fishing, it won't be in the Thames. I was just crossing the marketplace when I noticed a woman walking a little way ahead of me. As soon as I set eyes on her, I had a feeling that I'd seen her somewhere before. I could have sworn I knew her. I followed cautiously. She was a tallish, fattish woman, might have been forty or fifty, and the way she walked gave you the impression that her shoes were down at heel. Presently she got to a little sweet and paper shop. She turned almost towards me, and I saw three quarters of her face. And Jesus Christ! It was Elsie. It gave me such a shock. Not, mind you, seeing Elsie, but seeing what she'd grown to be like. It's frightening the things that 24 years can do to a woman. No man ever goes to pieces quite so completely as that. I'm the wrong shape, if you like. But at least I'm a shape. Elsie wasn't even particularly fat. She was just a kind of soft, lumpy cylinder, like a bag of meal. Finally, she turned in at the doorway of another shop. I stopped for a moment outside the window. G. Cookson, confectioner and tobacconist. So Elsie was Mrs. Cookson. I saw a rack of cheap pipes in the window, and I went in. The whole face had kind of sagged, as if it had somehow been drawn downwards. Her hair was a kind of dirty colour, and there was much less of it than there used to be. She didn't know me from Adam. I was just a customer. I wondered whether I'd changed even more than she had, or whether, what was the likeliest of all, she simply forgotten my existence. I want a pipe, I said flatly. A briar pipe. I know we'd got some pipes somewhere. Now where did I... Ah, here we are. How bad her accent had got. Or maybe I was just imagining that because my own standards had changed. I fiddled among the pipes and said I'd like one with an amber mouthpiece. Amber? Oh, I don't know as we got any... She turned towards the back of the shop and called, George! So the other bloke's name was George too. George? Where'd you put that other box of pipes? George came in. He was a small, stoutish chap with a bald head and a big, gingery-coloured soup strainer moustache. The two of them started poking round in search of the other box of pipes. No use trying to describe to you what I felt. A kind of cold, deadly, desolate feeling. The thought that was chiefly in my mind was how differently things turn out from what you expect. The July nights under the chestnut trees... Who'd have thought the time would ever come when there would be just no feeling whatever between us? And who'd ever have foreseen that Elsie would end up like this? I treated her badly, and many a time it had given me a bad half hour. She'll end up on the streets, I used to think, or stick her head in the gas oven. But how many women really end up on the streets? A damn sight more end up at the mangle. She hadn't gone to the bad or to the good either. She ended up like everybody else. 
They'd found the box of pipes. Of course, there weren't any with amber mouthpieces among them. Doesn't matter. I'll leave it, I said. I cleared out, and that was the last I ever saw of Elsie. The fact was that ever since I struck Lower Binfield, I'd been drinking almost continuously. The same as the other morning, I crawled over to the window and watched the bowler hats and school caps hustling to and fro. My enemies, I thought. As for the picturesqueness, the sham countrified stuff, it merely gives me the sick. And yet there was something that we had in those days. I'd come back to look for it, and I hadn't found it. And that started me thinking again about the pool at Binfield House. I'd had a feeling you could only describe as fear about going to see whether the pool still existed, with the great black fish still cruising round it. I took the car out and drove onto the upper Binfield Road. Halfway up the hill, the houses stopped and the beech trees began. Lord, how they were the same! I got out and walked. The same stillness, the same great beds of rustling leaves. I began to make my way through the little copse in the direction of Binfield House. They'd put up a high brick wall with spikes on top. It wasn't till I was actually at the gate that it occurred to me to wonder whether the pool was still inside the grounds. They wouldn't want a great pool of water for the loonies to drown themselves in. I strolled up the road to the right, and, gosh, there was the pool. All the trees were gone from round its edge. In fact, it looked extraordinarily like the round pond in Kensington Gardens. Kids were playing all round the edge, sailing boats and paddling. Over to the left there was a sort of pavilion and a sweet kiosk. Over to the right it was all houses, houses, houses. All the woods that used to grow so thick had been shaved flat. What a fool I'd been to imagine that these woods were still the same. There was just the one tiny bit of copse that hadn't been cut down, and it was pure chance that I'd walked through it on my way here. The water looked kind of dead. No fish in it now. There was a chap watching the kids, oldish, with a few tufts of white hair and a very sunburnt face. He was wearing shorts and sandals. I could see that he was one of those old men who'd never grown up. He was looking at me as if he'd like to speak. Upper Binfield's grown a great deal, I said. My dear sir, we never allow Upper Binfield to grow. We pride ourselves on being rather exceptional people up here, you know. Just a little colony of us all by ourselves. No connection with the town down there. He waved a hand in the direction of Lower Binfield. Nature! He waved a hand at what was left of the trees. Our young people grow up amid surroundings of natural beauty. We are nearly all of us enlightened people, of course. Would you credit that three quarters of us up here are vegetarians? I knew the type. Vegetarianism, simple life, nature worship, roll in the dew before breakfast. He began to show me round the estate. It was all faked up Tudor houses with the buttresses that don't buttress anything and the rock gardens with concrete bird baths. Some of the houses made me wish I'd got a hand grenade in my pocket. Finally I stopped and said, There used to be another pool besides the big one. Another pool? Oh, surely not. I don't think there was ever another pool. They may have drained it off, I said. It was a pretty deep pool. It would leave a big pit behind. For the first time, he looked a bit uneasy. Oh, uh, uh, of course you must understand our life up here is in some ways primitive. We prefer it so. But being so far from the town, some of our sanitary arrangements are not altogether satisfactory. The dust cart only calls once a month, I believe. You mean they've turned the pool into a rubbish dump? Well, there is something in the nature of, uh... He shied at the word rubbish dump. We have to dispose of tins and so forth, of course. Over there. They left a few trees to hide it. But, yes, 
It was my pool, all right. They drained the water off. It made a great round hole. Already it was half full of tin cans. I used to know this place before the war, I said. It was all woods then. There weren't any houses except Binfield House. But that little bit of copse over there hasn't changed. Ah, that. We have decided never to build in it. It is sacred to the young people. Nature, you know. He twinkled at me, a kind of roguish look, as if he was letting me into a little secret. We call it the Pixie Glen. I got rid of him, went back to the car. The Pixie Glen. And they'd filled my pool up with tin cans. God rot them. Doesn't it make you puke sometimes to see what they're doing to England with their bird baths and their pixies and tin cans where the beech woods used to be? Coming up for air. But there isn't any air. The dustbin that we're in reaches up to the stratosphere. As for my idea of going fishing... Fishing, indeed. At my age. Really, Hilda was right. If I didn't care More than words can say If I didn't care Would I feel this way? I dumped the car in the garage of the George and walked into the lounge. Somebody had switched on the wireless. I came through the door just in time to hear the last few words of an SOS, and it gave me a bit of a jolt, I admit, for the words I heard were, where his wife, Hilda Bowling, is seriously ill. I didn't wait to hear any more. I merely walked on into the private bar and ordered my pint as usual. I began to get the bearings of the situation. In the first place, Hilda wasn't ill, seriously or otherwise. She was shamming. Why? Obviously, it was just another of her dodges. She'd got wind somehow that I wasn't really at Birmingham, and this was just her way of getting me home. Because, of course, she'd taken it for granted that I was with a woman. And naturally, she assumed that I'd come rushing home as soon as I heard she was ill. But that's just where you've got it wrong, I thought to myself. And suddenly I decided that I would have a woman if I felt like it. It would serve Hilda right for being so dirty-minded. And besides, where's the sense of being suspected if it isn't true? But all the same, the lengths that women will go. Sometimes you can't help kind of admiring them. After breakfast, I strolled out into the marketplace. It was a lovely morning, with a pale yellow light like white wine playing over everything. Suddenly a fleet of great black bombers came whizzing over. The next moment I heard something. Without taking any kind of thought, I flung myself on my face. Nobody else had been half as prompt. I even had time to be afraid that I'd made a fool of myself for nothing. But the next moment... Boom! Brrr, a noise like the Day of Judgment, and then a noise like a ton of coal falling onto a sheet of tin. It started, I thought. There was a sound of screams and car brakes being suddenly jammed on. The second bomb which I was waiting for didn't fall. I raised my head a little. On every side, people seemed to be rushing round. I could hear a woman's voice shrieking, The Germans! The Germans! From somewhere, a black jet of smoke was streaming upwards. I picked myself up. People were calming down already, and quite a little crowd had begun to flock towards the place where the bomb had dropped. It wasn't a German aeroplane after all. It was only an accident. The planes were flying over to do a bit of bombing practice and somebody had put his hands on the lever by mistake. But there'd been a space of time when several thousand people believed we were at war. Another quarter of an hour and we'd have been lynching our first spy. The bomb had dropped in a little side street off the high street the one where Uncle Ezekiel used to have his shop. At first sight, it looked as if the sky had been raining bricks and vegetables. The bomb had blown a greengrocer's shop out of existence. But what everyone was looking at was the house on the left. 
Its wall was ripped off as neatly as if someone had done it with a knife. And what was extraordinary was that in the upstairs room, nothing had been touched. But the lower rooms had caught the force of the explosion. There was a frightful smashed-up mess. In among the broken crockery, there was lying a leg, with the trouser still on it, and a black boot. When the fire engine arrived, I cleared off to the George to pack my bag. This finishes me with Lower Binfield, I thought. I'm going home. I left my new rod and the rest of the fishing tackle in my bedroom. Let them keep it. There'll be no more fishing this side of the grave. What had I really felt when the bomb exploded? When I saw the smashed up house and the old man's leg, I'd had the kind of mild kick that you get from seeing a street accident. But it hadn't really made much impression. But as I got clear of the outskirts, all kinds of things that I'd been doubtful about, I felt certain about now. I'd come to Lower Binfield with a question in my mind. Can we get back to the life we used to live, or is it gone forever? Well, I'd had my answer. Lower Binfield had been tucked away, a sort of quiet corner that I could step back into when I felt like it. And finally I'd stepped back and found that it didn't exist. War is coming. 1941, they say and there'll be plenty of broken crockery and little houses ripped open like packing cases and the guts of the chartered accountant's clerk plastered over the piano that he's buying on the Never Never. I'll tell you what my stay in Lower Binfield had taught me. It's all going to happen. All the things you tell yourself are just a nightmare or only happen in foreign countries. The bombs, the food queues, the coloured shirts, the slogans... It's all going to happen. It seemed to me that I could see the whole of England. Think of the enormous stretches of land you pass over when you cross a corner of a single English county, and the fields and farmhouses and churches and the villages and the ducks walking across the green. Surely it's too big to be changed. And presently I struck into outer London, Miles and miles of ugly houses with people living dull, decent lives inside them. And beyond it, London stretching on and on, streets, squares, tenements, blocks of flats, pubs, fried fish shops, picture houses, and all the eight million people with their little private lives which they don't want to have altered. Surely they'll manage somehow to keep on with the life that they've been used to. Baloney. They're all for it. The bad times are coming. Everything you've ever known is going down into the muck. But when I got back to the suburb, my mood suddenly changed. It suddenly struck me that Hilda might really be ill after all. I'd taken it for granted that she was merely shamming. But as the Hesperides estate closed round me, I saw what bloody rot it was, sneaking off to Lower Binfield to try and recover the past, and then thinking a lot of prophetic baloney about the future. What's the future got to do with chaps like you and me? Holding down our jobs, that's our future. As for Hilda, even when the bombs are dropping, she'll still be thinking about the price of butter. Of course the SOS wasn't a fake. As though she'd have the imagination. At this moment she might be lying somewhere in ghastly pain, or even dead. I whizzed down Ellesmere Road at nearly forty miles an hour. So I'm fond of Hilda after all, you say. I don't know exactly what you mean by fond. Are you fond of your own face? Probably not, but you can't imagine yourself without it. It's part of you. Well, that's how I felt about Hilda. I got the door open and the familiar smell of old Macintoshes hit me. Hilda! I yelled. Hilda! Maybe they carted her away to hospital already. Maybe there was a corpse lying upstairs in the empty house. I started to dash up the stairs, but at the same moment the two kids came out of their rooms on either side of the landing. Lorna hung over the banisters. Where's your mother? I said. Mum is out. Then your mother hasn't been ill? No. Who said she'd been ill? So she had been shamming. 
I turned back to the front door, which I'd left open, and there was Hilda coming up the garden path. She wasn't dead. She was just as usual. There's nothing for your supper, she went on promptly. That's Hilda all over. Always manages to say something depressing the instant you set foot inside the house. I followed her indoors. I shut the door and switched on the light. I knew it would make things better if I took a strong line from the start. Now, I said, what the bloody hell do you mean by sending out that SOS? What SOS? What are you talking about, George? Are you trying to tell me that you didn't get them to send out an SOS saying you were seriously ill? Of course I didn't. I wasn't ill. I saw what had happened. I'd only heard the last few words of the SOS, and obviously it was some other Hilda Bowling. Hilda hadn't even showed that little bit of imagination. The sole interest in the whole affair had been the five minutes or so when I thought she was dead and found that I cared after all. And then she began questioning me in what I call her third-degree voice, which isn't angry and nagging, but quiet and kind of watchful. So, you heard this SOS in the hotel at Birmingham? Yes, last night. When did you leave Birmingham, then? This morning, of course. I left about ten. I had lunch at Coventry. Then how do you account for this? She suddenly shot out at me, and in the same instant she ripped her bag open, took out a piece of paper, and held it out as if it had been a forged cheque or something. I didn't even know what it was, except that it was something that proved I'd been off with a woman. Guilt written all over me in big letters. And I wasn't even guilty. But it's a matter of habit. I'm used to being in the wrong. It was a letter from what seemed to be a firm of solicitors, and it was addressed from the same street as Rowbottom's Hotel. Dear Madam, I read, with reference to your letter of the 18th, we think there must be some mistake. Rowbottom's Hotel was closed down two years ago and has been converted into a block of offices. Well, George, the day you left here, I wrote to Rowbottom's Hotel asking whether you'd arrived there, and you see the answer I got. And the very same post I got your letter saying you were at the hotel. You got someone to post it for you, I suppose. Listen, Hilda, I can explain the whole thing. I'm sure you could explain anything, George. The question is whether I'd believe you. Her face had gone a kind of white under the surface, the way it does when she thinks of me with another woman. If only it had been true. And gosh, what I could see ahead of me. The weeks on end of ghastly nagging and sulking. But what really got me down was if I spent a week explaining to Hilda why I'd been to Lower Binfield, she'd never understand. Did I even understand myself? Whatever motives I might have had, I could hardly remember them now. The old life in Lower Binfield, the war and the after-war, Hitler, Stalin, bombs, food queues, it was fading out, all fading out. Nothing remained except a vulgar, low-down row in a smell of old Macintoshes. Really, there was no reason why this row shouldn't go on till three in the morning. All I wanted was the line of least resistance, and in my mind I ran over the three possibilities, which were A. To tell her what I'd really been doing and somehow make her believe me. B. To pull the old gag about losing my memory. C to let her go on thinking it was a woman and take my medicine. But, damn it, I knew which it would have to be. And would I be sure that this is love beyond compare? Would all this be true if I didn't care? For you Tim McInerney was reading Coming Up for Air by George Orwell. It was abridged by Ellen Stein and produced by Clive Brill. It was a Brill production for BBC Radio.